he went and he was a sound man for another band and they had a deal that they went to they went to Trident and they recorded with Roy Thomas Baker but Ken was there wow so i happened to be doing the the chapter on Trident at the time and one of the things that we did was he, he Ken laid out the the layout of Trident and how you know everything was in a machine room upstairs and everything but I looked at this one picture, and Ken was in it. It was Ken, Roy Thomas Baker, and a couple guys from the band. And there was a tape machine behind him in the control room. Next time I talked to Ken, I said, Ken, you never told me about the tape machine. He said, oh, th there was never a tape machine in the control room. I said, Ken, I have the picture right here. <laughs> I said, no, that, there was never, that never happened. <laughs> he said, you know, you should talk to whoever was the the maintenance guy there the head maintenance guy which i did he said no we never did that you know we, we always had a machine room we never put it in the control room i talked to three people that swore up and down that was wasn't the case and i had the photographic evidence finally i <laughs> sent it to everybody and one of them came back and said oh yeah i sort of remember that once we we did that. We pulled the tape machine into the control room. It was only for a week or so. And it's like, well, you know, I have it. I have the evidence and, and everybody is remembering something else. So it just goes to show you the power or the, yeah, <laughs> you know, what you're, what you can remember and what you can't in selective memorization, so to yes. speak. Yeah. That's so wild. My, my, my friend was telling me in like um, the, the Hulu documentary with Paul McCartney, I, I forgot it was either one, two, three or three, two, one. I think it was McCartney 321 with uh, Rick Rubin. I don't know if you saw it. Uh, um, no, I haven't yet. Oh, it's 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 lovely. Like um but he was saying that there there are things that Paul, you know, tell over in that documentary that are factually not true, but it's how yeah. Paul remembers working with the Beatles. So it's like you know, like people are going to live, you know, experience their lives how they experience and they tell their own narratives and it's like it's just the human condition, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it is. It's yeah. great. Yeah, wild. We see things differently. Yeah, I was thinking also about that the other the the Get Back documentary when you were talking about this because that was I don't know if you saw that one either. <laughs> it was a, it took me like two months to watch because <laughs> it was so long. No, and for that reason. And for that reason, yeah, I literally <laughs> yeah. I would watch like twenty minute chunks. <laughs> like, yeah, that's all I have to start to do. It was it was it was like oh my my wife went out one evening and I was like okay cool I'm gonna like put like forty minutes into this. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you yeah. know, it was, it was literally that. Um, but was so like what you were kind of talking about, like you're talking, you're, you're calling all these people, and you're really like after all these things, you f feel like you vicariously lived it, and like that's what that experience of watching the Get Back documentary is like. And you feel so much like you're in the room with the Beatles that yeah. there's a moment where Linda takes a photo, and then and then the the screen switches from what's happening in the room to the photo, and then you're your your like brain melts because you realize this was 50 years ago and until yeah, that moment yeah. you're like living with the beatles and it's uh it was a trip <laughs> well i knew jeff emmerich as well and i would he wouldn't speak about it much you know the only time he would speak about it is if you asked him a question then he would he would tell you and he we wouldn't tend to elaborate a lot Jeff was kind of the guy, one of the stories that was told to me was Jeff had lived in Hollywood Hills next to his neighbors for like 40 years, and they never knew that his connection with the Beatles or the music industry, he never mentioned it. They'd always talk about gardening or, you know, construction on their houses or never once, they were shocked when they yeah. found out. A legend. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, when I was at AES, I, I I saw that he had he was at AES like I don't know an hour after I had left, and I felt like oh my gosh, I just like was so close to the Beatles, and uh, that yeah. I guess that moment will never be never happen again. But uh, you know, yeah. one a very proud moment in my life, and it's something that's very small. I was at an AES show. It was in San Francisco, and I was walking on down one side of the street, and Jeff was on the other side, and he stopped. And he walked across the street to say hi to me. And I, even thinking about it now, it's like, this is so amazing that he recognized who I am, that he would do that. Yeah. So, I, you know, again, it's something that's so small but meant so much to me. Yeah, I totally get that. 
it's uh yeah. you're kind of you're there i don't know it's that little bit yeah. of of being there with uh i guess like the artists that we most uh, i guess and engineers that we most look up to that's so yeah another another great thing about podcasting is getting to meet m- meet people that do what we do at the highest yeah. caliber well i met two beatles too really yes it, it very much in passing i was doing this um a record at uh, Cherokee, Cherokee Recording in, in Hollywood, and there were three studios there. I was in one, and Ringo was in the other. And in those days, uh, it, it it was no big deal to like go back and forth. You'd hear something cool coming out of the studio, and you'd puck your head in. Uh, I was mixing, and uh, you could feel that the air kind of moves, you know, when the door opens. And I could feel it, and I looked back, and it was Ringo, and he. Give me one of these things. And I, th- <laughs> and I was like, wow, that is cool. So I didn't talk to him, but, you know, <laughs> I did have... Now, it was different with George. And again, this is... <laughs> it only happens in Hollywood. It's uh, all I can say. Right. So I, I bought two tickets to a Ravi concert. Uh, no, I didn't buy them. There was a friend that gave me two tickets to a Ravi Shankar concert. So I was taking my girlfriend... Well, we had a fight, and uh, she decided she didn't want to go. So to make a long story short, I sold the ticket outside. So when I come in, uh, it, it says row YY, and they take me up to the very, very last seat in the house in the balcony, as far as you can go away. And I thought, well, fair enough. I, you know, I was given these tickets. And somebody came over and said, no, 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 it's, that, that's not, not there. Follow me. And it was front row center. So there was a guy next to me, and I looked, and I thought, that's George Harrison. But he wasn't dressed like you'd expect George Harrison to be dressed. He was just sort of like a lumberjack, yeah. if you can imagine that. Yeah. He had a plaid flannel shirt on, and I, I, I was torn in between, is that George or is it not? But we had this conversation whenever Araga was stopped. Because, you know, it would go on for 20 minutes, 25 minutes, and stop, and then there'd be time. And, I, you know, we'd just exchange some pleasantries. And I was never sure it was really him until the concert finished and he walked on stage to <laughs> greet Ravi Shankar. Oh, my Lord. And then it was like, oh, yeah, okay, I guess <laughs> that was him. Now, the luckiest guy in the world was the guy I sold the seat to for $15, who happened to sit? Who got to sit next to me, front row center? Had I known you know, <laughs> what I the ticket was, more. Yeah. yeah, especially getting to meet George Harrison. That's uh, yeah, right. That's a very valuable ticket. That's an amazing yeah. story. Thank you for sharing that with me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> wow. Only in Hollywood, though. Only in Hollywood. I'll have to make it out to Hollywood again. <laughs> <laughs> the place to be. So yeah. let's talk about your new book, The Mixing Engineer's Handbook, uh, edition five, the fifth edition. Uh, I guess you kind of already said that there's a bunch of stuff about Atmos and spatial mixing. Uh, what else uh, did you bring to the table this time? Self-mastering. Uh, there's a, Everything has been updated and it's been all uh, fine-tuned for mixing in the box. The last one was you know, somewhat, but now we're five years beyond that. And things have changed. There's a lot on intelligent processors that uh, they weren't even, I don't think they existed, you know, for the last book. Uh, A lot more just on general processing, uh, the general being in the box. There's new interviews. There's four new interviews. And what I did, actually, it took many of the other interviews that were in the, the original editions, and I put them online as well. So now there's 32 total interviews, I think, between in the book and online. Wow. And the, one of the reasons why is I, I tried to make it a little, I tried to skew a little younger on this. So I was trying to be as, as modern as possible and, and the work, the way people work today, you know, Right. When I first started the book, it was all console driven. So, uh, and gradually, it the book has changed with the way we've evolved in in mixing. Yeah, I, th- I think I heard you mention on the Working Class Audio with uh, Matt Boudreau uh, how younger engineers are using a lot more saturation than that than people used to use back in the day. You were, I think, you were bemoaning it. <laughs> mm, yeah. Okay. Well, you're getting me in my soapbox now. I love it. Um, I want to hear the soapbox. 
Okay. Tape saturation is especially one that gets me. And the reason why is it's something we hated back in the day. Yeah. I mean, it was something that we, yes, there's a certain glue that would happen and and that was kind of a byproduct, but it was nothing that we're looking for. As a matter of fact, it'd be one of those things where you'd be tracking something and you'd be listening off the console. In other words, right, you know, from from the, the studio floor through the mics, then you're listening to it directly. It would sound so good. And then you would, you would capture the tape and play it back and you go, why doesn't it sound like that? This whole romanti- romanticizing of tape and tape saturation, uh, I don't get as somebody that was there. Mm-hmm. So, so that's Interesting. The, one of the big things. You know, I hear about people using tape saturation. It's like, I, I, why? Anyway, I, I don't want to sound like, you know, get off my lawn. I don't want to sound like that guy. <laughs> no, but it's um, important for people to kind of understand the the history of it. You know what I mean? Like I yeah. wasn't around for those days, so I I'm super curious to hear what it was like back then because I've yeah I, I've only known the Dawes, right? And one of the reasons why everybody liked when we finally got to digital digital tape, like the Sony 3348s and things like that, was we were getting a truer representation of what we we're hearing because we didn't have that tape saturation. So that's why digital caught on like that. It was like, oh, yeah, wait a second. This is what we're looking for all along. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, it went another step when, when we went into Pro Tools and went into the box. Uh, now, in terms of saturation in general, I understand where that can be effective and where it is effective, and I use it occasionally myself. Now, what I will say, though, is I don't think it's something to rely on. I think it's a Band-Aid for the most part. <laughs> so it wouldn't be... No, wait, no, hear me out. I'm it wouldn't be yeah. something that I would use, like, first thing. Oh, I got to put the saturator on, first thing. No, it'd be like, I can't make this work any other way. What else do I have? Oh, let's try the saturator. Oh, now it pops out of the mix. Oh, that's good. So I can see it in those terms. It's the same thing with, with like, techniques like side chaining. Right. Where people will use that as a... I, I think it's almost like a crutch. Okay, we'll use this so now we can hear the kick and bass together. Well, wait, if you just do this right, <laughs> the way you've been doing it for 50 years or even longer now, 60 years, you know, you won't have to use that. You won't have to do that. Right. So there's a lot of things to me that are kind of Band-Aids right. that, uh, you know, people with the right technique, they wouldn't need yeah. more as much. Yeah, it's, fun- I, it's funny. I already mentioned Nacho, but but we were talking about this also of like how... He also doesn't really use a lot of side chaining if he can avoid it, um, because when the bass impacts at the same time as the kick, that's a bigger impact, right? Like, I like that. I like the way. That, I mean, maybe it's because I come from more of a rock and roll background and not like an EDM background. But when the kick and the bass hit at the same time, there's like a certain magic to that. Also, I'm a bass player, so like I love locking in with the kick drum, and I know what that feels like, and it it hits harder than than a side chain kick that's just squashing the bass out of the way. And so when you yeah. get that EQ relationship right, it's a better, it feels better, I think. And, but of course, there are genres where side chaining is important, I think. But yeah, it depends. There are times when it, when it's very helpful. There's no question. Right. It's just like, don't rely on it for every single thing in the mix. Yeah. You know, in every mix. Yes. Yeah. It's interesting. I, I, I think a lot of what people are doing these days are, are because we have these fancy new like de harshifiers. I don't know what the the word is for stuff like soothe or or just even dynamic like like little cues on the Pro Q3 or whatever to kind of get rid of these harsh little elements. And then when you've gotten the vocal all cleaned up, it can start to feel anemic. And so that's when people kind of push saturation into it to kind of make up for that uh, lack of uh, fullness, so to speak. No. Okay. Well, you know, I get They're it. They're like teach their own. <laughs> I mean, no, yeah, you got to do what you got to do to make it work. And, and everybody has their own way of getting there. So it's not like, you know, there's one, one true way to do it. I, again, when... It gets to the point where you have six and seven different plugins on every channel. It's like, well, wait a second. It might not, you might not be doing this the right way. Uh, the classic story. This is the, the best story I have mm-hmm. when it comes to this. Yeah, yeah. A very, very old and great friend of mine, Benny Facconi, has uh, 18 Grammys. Whew. Most of them are, are Latin Grammys, but he's done all the major Latin stars, Santana, and, you know, everybody can think of Mana is one of his big clients. And um, 
He knows what he's doing. And he knows.